Hello everyone. I've got yet another Yes welder to check out. This time it is a 400 amp stick welder. It's the ARC 400Q. This welder was recently on sale for $169, so I decided to check it out. This is actually one of the machines that motivated me to reach out to Yes Welder about issues with the specs and ads on their website. Their representative said that they do plan to correct mistakes and they plan to put better user manuals on their YouTube channel and other social media. That's great, but I hope they also correct the website and Amazon ads as well because that is where people are looking while actively purchasing the machines. For instance, on the website, it says that this machine can use up to 328 foot, quote, welding wire, and that two gauge would be recommended in that case, but if you stick to 164 feet, three gauge is enough. Now, they may be talking about the power cord, in which case those wire sizes would be okay, but it specifically says welding wire, which I think most people would take to mean the actual welding leads. In that case, even two gauge would not be nearly enough for 328 feet of length. Even if you were running at just 120 amps, two gauge welding leads 328 feet long would result in something like a 60% voltage drop in the cables themselves. At anywhere near 400 amps, both scenarios they give would result in a 100% loss in the cables. So I have to assume that they mean the power cord could be extended that far, not the welding cables but it does say welding wire. Uh, either way, whether they mean the power cord, their wording is a bit off, or if they mean the welding cables, then they're way off on the numbers. The ad also says this machine has lift start TIG, but any TIG done with this machine would be scratch start, not lift start. It's a small distinction, but there is a distinction. And many of Yes Welder's machines do in fact have a specific lift start TIG mode, and this welder does not. It also says it has adjustable hot start and arc force. It does have adjustable arc force, but it does not have adjustable hot start. This welder can run on a wide range of input voltages. The manual implies that the welder has a full 60% duty cycle regardless of the connected supply voltage, but the data tag clearly says that the 60% duty cycle is only 200 amps when running on lower voltages. The manual also says the welder can run 1 16th inch to 3 16th inch diameter electrodes. Well, if this welder can actually put out 400 amps at a 60% duty cycle, there's no reason it shouldn't be able to easily run most 1 quarter inch electrodes. So that's just another strange spec. In fact, the website even goes as far as to say that on 220 volts, this welder is only capable of under 5 32nd inch electrodes and only capable of welding under 1 quarter inch steel. I've run 5 32nd inch 7018 electrodes at 160 amps on welders less than half this size. So all the specs are just a little confusing. The website also claims that this welder is great for 6010, while the manual does not list 6010 among the usable electrodes. I'll test out 6010 when I start running this welder and see how it actually does. I know it sounds like I'm being super critical and harping on all these little issues, but I only point this stuff out because Yes Welder is getting popular and they're trying to make a name for themselves in the community. They're pushing social media campaigns and they're about to release a new welder as part of a crowdfunding campaign. Misleading and confusing wording in the ads, incorrect and confusing specs, and differences between advertised specs, the manual, and the data tag are all things that I really think Yes Welder needs to make a priority to correct. They do claim to be working on this stuff and planning to correct these kinds of issues and I really hope that's the case. They clearly have a very active marketing department, and I think it's only fair that they make an effort to present accurate information to potential customers. This welder does come with much better cables than other Yes Welder products have tested. They're a bit small for a 400 amp machine, but they are at least copper and have decent insulation. I would love to see the rest of their machines come with these same cables, rather than the aluminum cables with poor insulation that I've seen with other machines that they have so far. The work clamp is still pretty flimsy and the jaws already kind of aren't lining up quite right and kind of get jammed together. And the electrode holder is just copper plated cast iron jaws, but at least it's not stamped steel. It also comes with an extra set of DINs connectors. The welder can run on single or three phase power and the spec sheet claims an input range from 208 to 480 volts. Interestingly, 
The tag on the back only says 180 to 420 volts. So I wonder just how safe it would be to actually connect a 480 volt three phase power supply to this welder. Utility companies are allowed some regulation leeway and it's not unheard of to see a 480 volt system sitting at 500 volts or so incoming from the utility supply. The connection guide in the manual is also a little strange. Option one shows single phase power with no ground, which could present a safety issue. I have no idea why they don't show a ground on that setup. Setup two is a single phase setup with two legs and the neutral connected to the input terminals. Since these connections go straight to a three phase diode rectifier, having the neutral connected along with the two main legs wouldn't really do anything. It doesn't hurt anything, but since the neutral voltage is always in phase with the other wires and at half the potential, it won't provide anything to the system. It doesn't hurt anything, but the neutral is pointless in that setup. The third option shown is a straightforward three phase connection. The welder doesn't come with a power cord of any kind, so you'll have to supply one yourself. I made one out of some SO cord I have. It does come with crimp on ring terminals, but only three. If you want to connect this to three phase power and a ground, you'll need an extra ring terminal. No big deal, but don't just wrap the wire around the screw and <laughs> jam it all together like I have there. And that was just because I wasted one of the terminals on something else. Internally, there is stuff to like, as well as unfortunate evidence of cost cutting. It's all very simple and clean, and I like the general layout. The main capacitors are on this board, and there are bleed down resistors and the capacitors stick down into the airflow path. The control board is a separate part. The main inverter IGBTs are on their own board on one side. The transformer is in the middle and the output diodes are on their own board on the other side. It's a simple, clean setup. On the other hand, the supply power goes directly into the rectifier, so there's zero input filtering on the supply side. Also, the rectifier is just bolted to the metal case with just this little plate of aluminum sandwiched in between. So, not technically a heat sink. That little aluminum plate is pretty small, so I don't see it offering enough heat mass to make much difference if you're running this welder hard for more than a couple minutes. And it's just completely out of the airflow. It would have been much better if there was a cutout underneath this and there were actually fins on the back of this plate that kind of protruded down into the airflow, but that's not the case. This is just solid steel underneath this and this is just bolted to it. As it stands, I question how hot this rectifier will run if the welder's pushed very hard. Hopefully it won't be an issue. Also, the ground screw is right here, and it is just a screw in the painted rear panel. Zero effort was made to ensure proper metal-to-metal -metal connection. There's actually paint under the screw and even in the threads. And there's no further ground wires connected to that screw on the inside to go to other panels or anything like that. All of it is just relying on the screwed connections between all the different pieces. It's probably okay, but it's something that definitely could have been done much better. Also, all of these uh, internal conductors are just aluminum. They're pretty short and they're pretty thick, so it's not a big deal, but it would have been nice to see those as copper because 400 amps seems like an awful lot of current to push through these little straps of aluminum. As for the controls of the welder, there's just an amperage display, an arc force control knob, and a just output current control knob. No other switches, buttons, or controls. I'm totally fine with a setup like this as long as it performs well and holds up well. And with that, let's get it back together and see how it does. And real quick before I get started welding, I just wanted to point out that I did uh, correct all these connections or neaten up these connections on the back. I didn't leave it the way it was before. It was just kind of very temporary while the machine was apart. I just wanted to get power connected to it so I could check a couple things inside, but I did actually neaten that up before I'm going to do any real welding with it. Just thought I'd point that out. So I've confirmed that when running on 240 volts, the welder tops out at 200 amps. It doesn't simply have a lower duty cycle above 200 amps. The output actually maxes out at 200 amps when running on 240 volt input. This is despite the fact that the setting on the display still goes up to 400 amps. The supply power goes straight to the rectifier, so the controls have no connection to the incoming AC supply they only are connected to the DC output from the rectifier. Therefore, the controls have no way to know if the welder is running on single or three-phase power. 
it only knows what the rectified DC output voltage is. So the only way this welder could ever provide over 200 amps is if there is some DC voltage level above which the controls will switch to 400 amps of output. Unfortunately, I don't have any way of providing the welder more than 240 volts AC, so I cannot confirm whether or not the output would actually go up with a higher input voltage. Amp draw was bouncing around 40 to 45 amps when powered by 240 volt single phase and maxed at 200 amps of output. And therein lies the reason for the output limitation. If this welder provided 400 amps of output on this input voltage, current draw would probably be peaking around 100 amps. Since I already mentioned that the display goes to 400 amps, it should be clear by now that when running on 240 volts, the display is wildly different from the actual output amperage. And unfortunately, it's not as simple as just providing half of what the display shows at all settings. When set at 120 amps, it provides just under 80 amps. When set at 180, it provides about 115. When set around 280 amps, it provides about 150 amps of output, and a setting of 400 gives 200 amps of output. If the controls are in some way limiting the output due to the input voltage, it would be nice if the controls also changed the display to match. There is a current pickup in the welder, so the controls theoretically know what the output current actually is. Still, it's possible that when running on a higher input voltage, the output will max out at 400 and the display will be more accurate. However, my guess is that the 400Q either doesn't actually provide the full 400 amps regardless of input voltage, or the data tag is incorrect about how much current it draws on higher voltages. If the specs are to be believed, max output on 460 volt three phase is 400 amps at 31.6 volts. This works out to just over 12 and a half kilowatts of output power. The data tag says max draw in that situation would be 16 amps. Well, 16 amps at 460 volt three phase with a unity power factor is also just over 12 and a half kilowatts. So for those specs to be possible, this welder would have to operate at a unity power factor with virtually zero internal losses. But if it ran at unity power factor with no loss, it would be able to provide around 365 amps of output with an input of 240 volt single phase at 44 amps. Yet it manages only 200 amps of output with that amount of input power. So obviously it isn't running anywhere near a unity power factor. And it wouldn't need heat sinks or a cooling fan if there were zero losses, not to mention breaking the laws of physics. The point is, either this welder doesn't actually provide 400 amps of output on 460 volt three phase, or the data tag is very wrong about how much current it will draw at 460 volts. Considering that the manual lists a max electrode size of 3 16 of an inch, the 400 amp output claim is a bit suspect. I really wish I had access to 480 volt power to find out, but at the very least, the numbers on the data tag cannot be correct. Moving on to what I could test, the hot start feature doesn't seem to be very aggressive. Arc starts are okay, but it honestly seemed about as prone to sticking the rod at start as a welder without hot start. Normally with hot start, you can easily get a rod going even if the welder is set a little cold. With this machine, if it was set a little cold, arc starts were noticeably more difficult. So if it has a hot start function, it's not very aggressive. The arc force adjustment was pretty subtle as well. With the arc force all the way down, the amperage output is steady even when I vary the arc length. With the arc force set at max, the amperage does bounce around a bit, but only a small handful of amps, even when I cram the rod into the puddle. And the arc really didn't feel much different whether the arc force was set at minimum or maximum. Because of the amperage changes, it definitely has some effect, but it's subtle. It's not like some welders where it seems like you could just about jam a rod straight through a block of steel when you have the arc force cranked up. Surprisingly, this welder ran 332nd 6010 pretty well. Arc starts were finicky with 6010, but once it was running, the arc didn't go out very often, even when I was whipping the rod and long arcing a bit. Keep in mind, my technique here is not instructive of how to run a 6010. I was just whipping the rod around in different ways to see how prone the arc was to going out. And I was pleasantly surprised to find that on this welder, it was not at all prone to going out. So 
that is a definite point in this Waller's Corner. Sometimes I comment on fan noise and sometimes not. Normally, I don't really think about it all that much. I might make a point of paying attention to fan noise so that I can comment on volume or pitch, but most of the time I don't think about it and sometimes I even forget to comment on it. I do appreciate a fan that shuts off when not welding, but it's normally not a big deal either way. This welder was the exception. I couldn't fail to notice the fan noise. It's relatively loud, but the main issue for me is that there's something about the tone or a resonance to the sound of the fan that bothers my ears. I do have fairly sensitive ears, so it may or may not bother others, but I found myself turning the welder off at every opportunity. I would finish a particular weld, and before I even finished pulling my gloves off, I would become aware that the fan noise was annoying me, and I'd reach for the power switch of the welder. Not a big deal, just another thing I noticed. Overall, for the price I paid, this is a solid stick welder. It has 200 amps of output on 240 volt single phase power, though you will need a 50 amp circuit if you want to run at 200 amps for very long. It runs 6010 surprisingly well. It seems to have a simple design that should be fairly robust. Keep in mind, my assumption of robustness is just that. It's an assumption. And it's an assumption that the components are reasonable enough quality and that the rectifier won't overheat despite not technically having a proper heat sink. It comes with pretty cheap accessories, but they are a step above what comes with other Yes Welder products I've looked at so far. It doesn't have the most refined arc, and it's fairly basic, but it works okay for what it is. If you find it on sale for under 200 like I did, and you don't mind the large size and you have 240 volt circuit to run it from, it might be a better option than a lot of the small under $200 stick welders out there. But on the other hand, the display is wildly inaccurate, at least when running on 240 volt power. Pretty much everything about the specs and marketing claims are confusing, sometimes misleading, and sometimes downright inaccurate. And unless you have a 480 volt supply, you won't get any more output than you can get in many welders half this size. Even three phase power at 240 volts or less will be limited to 200 amps of output due to the way the internal supply is wired. And at this point, I'm only assuming you get more output if you connect a higher voltage supply. Unfortunately, I can't test that. But if the max current draw spec for 460 volt three phase power is correct on the data tag, I would guess the output doesn't change much at higher voltages. One way or another, the data tag is inaccurate. It's just a matter of whether the input current is wrong, the max output is wrong, or both. Is any of that a deal breaker considering the price of this welder? Maybe or maybe not, depending on your perspective. But at the regular price of $400, I'd personally look elsewhere. Hopefully that was helpful. If you have any questions or if there's anything else you'd like me to test out with this welder, let me know. As always, thanks for watching. Take care.